Good morning. Uh, my name is Wally Young. I'm technical product manager for Daiquiri. Uh, I focus mainly on developer experience, the developer tools, and algorithms that run on our devices. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about developing applications for Daiquiri devices. <clears throat> so just a brief aside, um, I, as I said, I work for Daiquiri. And our mission is to redefine what's humanly possible everywhere. And the idea is whether you're at work and you're wearing a Daiquiri smart helmet or you end work, you get on the road, you have a HUD and that content transfers seamlessly onto the HUD in your car, you get out of the car, you walk home, you put on a pair of smart glasses and you start uh, a new or the same AR experience uh, now in your home. Uh, we're about just under 300 people. We have uh, half a dozen offices across the world and we have a very heavy engineering focus. Um, we make the Daiquiri Smart Helmet, Daiquiri Smart Glasses, and the HUD. Um, and what we're going to do today is talk about how do we make applications like these. So let's dive in and just start out with our software architecture. At the very bottom, we have all of our devices. Um, it comes with you know really strong processors. We use uh, Intel M7 processors. Um, all of the different sensors you need to be able to understand the environment, the uh, wide angle field of view lenses so that uh, are see-through so you can render content. On top of that, we have the same OS across all of our devices that we call VOS, or the Visual Operating System. And uh, the way Brian always talks about it, our CEO, is that it's an operating system for the world, not necessarily for your device. Uh, on top of that, we have our APIs, which are exposed in a C++ layer. And then on top of that, we have the layer that we're going to play with today, which is our extension for Unity. And then, of course, on top of that are the developer applications. And it, one of the main takeaways here is that no matter when or what you build for on the Daiquiri ecosystem, it's going to run on all of our devices. The APIs are the same. The interfaces are the same. They should be binary compatible. Here's a pretty picture. Uh, so. At a glance, uh, you're fastest on your machine, so we wanted to make sure that all of our tools work on whatever platform you work on. We support Linux, we support Mac, we support Windows. Um, everything, all of our sensors, uh, positional tracking, thermal camera, depth cameras, all of that can be accessed through our Unity extension. And we do a lot of the hard parts for you because we are working all the way from silicon to the software and application layer. Uh, we handle a lot of hard things like stereoscopy, uh, calibration, interaction patterns. Uh, all of that is just sort of taken care of for you. Uh, we have a one-click deploy. When I click Build in Unity, it appears on my helmet or my glasses. I can put that on and then start using it. Uh, and we've architected it in such a way that it's really easy to bring content you've already built into the Daiquiri ecosystem. I mean, if, if you've used a variety of AR SDKs, there's very similar paradigms that come into play. It, Reporting content's not that hard. And it's in use today by about 150 plus companies. So let's talk about some of the, uh, the main components and paradigms which we include in the SDK. The big ones are the display, the tracked object, and the initializer. And the idea is the display represents the user's perspective as they move through space. Uh, the tracked object represents I come with props. The tracked object represents something that is interesting in the world. It doesn't necessarily have to be this image, but if I want to display content relative to something, I can use this to localize to the space. So if I have this on the table and I want to augment something on these water bottles, I know because of where this is and where those are how to draw that content. If I don't care about having something in the space actually, what I can do is I can use the initializer. And what the initializer is is it just drops content in front of you or relative to the user in some way. Uh, the big interaction paradigms we use, uh, the big one we call gaze and dwell, generally considering most of our devices are used for work, we figured you need to be hands-free, uh, we use a gaze and dwell paradigm. So uh, the gaze and dwell paradigm is essentially when you're wearing the helmet, you'll see a little white dot in front of you, we call that the reticle, and it's basically what you use to interact with the digital content. You move your head around, and as it comes over things that it can interact with, it will turn into a circle, and if it's something that I can click and I stay on it, you'll see it does this sort of little click animation. And all of that's built on the fly and handled for you in the plugin. All you need to do is say, this is interactive, or this is clickable, and it will automatically go through those states and deliver those events to you. 
Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about was body space. Obviously, we talk about AR. We want a lot of things in the world. Sometimes there are things that you need to do repeatedly or things you want to have at a glance. And body space is exactly what it sounds like. It's a space around your body. If you want to look down, there's a way to easily bring all your content around you as well. Uh, diving in a little deeper, the display object, as I said, it represents the user's perspective as they move through the real world space. Um, and that means when the application starts, I'm sitting at the origin, 0, 0, 0 in uh, the Unity hierarchy. And then as I move one meter, I translate one Unity unit in the scene graph or in the hierarchy view. So that means everything's true to scale. So you would see, uh, much as this image to the right, this sort of helmet that's painting this uh, 3D reconstruction, that would sort of be the display object in the Unity hierarchy. And just a brief aside, uh, this is part of our 3D reconstruction uh, that we have demoed in our uh, booth today, if you want to take a look at it. Um, and the big thing is, of course, it's true to scale. If you're in the editor, you don't want to deploy a device yet, you hit play, you can click JAG and WASD to emulate all that sort of functionality. Tracked object uh, is basically, again, used to align content. Uh, generally, this is going to be a two-dimensional, flat and rigid object. If you want to augment something with 3D, like, a, say, a burner or a large piece of equipment, you can place one of these nearby, and you look at that, and then we're able to localize the content, and our, then our tracker, our six-degree uh, positional tracker, will then track how I move through space to display the content relative to where it needs to be. And again, all of this is true to scale. One unity unit equals one meter. It makes it really easy to align content. So what we're going to do today is we're going to open up Unity. Uh, we're going to set up our prefabs in the scene. And then we're going to add some content, a little bit of interactivity. And then we would be able to build it to device. So uh, let's just jump right into it. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up Unity. I'm going to make a new project. And because we are at AWE, I'm going to call it AWE Tutor, if I can spell. I think that's English. Uh, click 3D, because it's a 3D scene, not a 2D scene. And then things will happen. I've heard of demoitis before, but I've actually never seen the application not open. <laughs> Take two this time with feeling. OK, so it made it. So uh, while this loads, and I'm assuming it's loading, and it's been a beach ball of death, um, I'm going to try again. I think it's probably just trying to connect to the internet, and that's what makes it unhappy. So let's just work offline. There are, two, there are two companies in the world that know how to really lock down the internet. That's defense contractors and conferences. <laughs> All right, so we're inside Unity. I'm going to start uh, by just importing the package. And I go to Assets, Import Custom Package. This is the sort of normal step you go to. Um, I've already got this downloaded on the desktop. And I'm going to just see. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. I'm going to click Import, all of this stuff selected. Uh, while this is selected, let's talk about a little bit of the changes in the scene hierarchy than what you're used to in Unity. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to delete the main camera. And the reason is, is the display object take care, takes care of that for you. As I said before, that represents my, my body, myself wearing the helmet. As I move through space, it's going to build the cameras that are right for whatever device I'm using. So we're going to do that. 
under prefabs, you're going to see all the same kind of, well, if you could read that, uh, you're going to see all the same kind of prefabs. You've got your body space, you have display, you have tracked object. Uh, I'm just going to drag a display into the hierarchy. I do not care about my multi-port adapter. And uh, then I'm going to drag oh, scene view, a uh, tracked object in because I want to localize uh, to that thing that I just threw on the floor. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select, OK, what image do I want to use? And um, we, we include some in our SDK. So when you download the SDK, we, we supply this one and this one. Uh, but I'm going to choose this guy. You're going to see it shows up in the inspector over here. And I'm going to set how big it is physically in the world. Uh, and that is 0.2 meters, not 2.3, 0.2. And because of it has the aspect ratio of the image, it's going to already know the height. If I set one, it'll set the other for me, just something to make it easier. Now, since the display happens at 000, zero, zero uh, since I'm going to be showing you this in the editor, I'm just going to move this out a couple meters. And now we essentially have an app. But really, we're not going to show anything because I'm going to look at the tracked object, and it's going to display nothing because I've put nothing on it. So let's put something on it. And for that, we also supply a smart helmet. So I'm just going to drag that guy on top of the tracked object. And uh, similar with any other AR SDK, uh, most things that go under your tracked object or your trackable or your marker uh, will turn on when, it, when the object is recognized. Uh, so basically, by making the helmet a child of the tracked object, I say, when I see this, display this. So I'm going to size this to make it a little bit more appropriate for this, 90 degrees. And then just draw it out of the marker. And we have a helmet. So the easy thing to do is I can hit play. Uh, you can see I built the reticle already. I can click and drag, look around. I can use WASD or up, down, left, right to move around. Uh, first thing to notice is you don't see the content yet. And that's because we also wanted you to be able to demo what it would look like if I recognized this in the editor as well. So you don't have to worry about building to device just to see that that event works correctly. So walk up, receive helmet. Uh, but let's add a little bit of interactivity to it. So what I want to do is when I see the helmet, I want to mouse over the helmet or interact with the reticle over the helmet. I want it to change color. Maybe I want to click, have it change to another color. And when I look away, I want it to go back. And this is going to be really simple. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a collider on it. Um, anyone who's done games, 3D graphics would be pretty. It, Collider is a pretty common thing. It's basically saying, this is something I want to interact with. Normally, you could use it uh, for physics or other things. It's just an easy way for us to say, yes, this is actually an object I want to interact with. That's close enough. And then I'm just going to add an event trigger. This is just a standard piece of Unity. And I'm going to say that I want to do an on pointer enter. And I'm going to choose the helmet shell which is this one, and drag it over there. And what I want to do is I want to change the material on it, because I want to change what it looks like. So let's make a brand new material. And I'm going to set this to a pretty color, like very, very bright red. And then under function, I'm going to say, OK, I want to change the mesh renders uh, material. And I'm just going to drag that in. So now I'd be able to look at it. It would turn red. It would never not turn red. So let's add the opposite. Uh, in this case, it's going to be on pointer exit. Luckily, it copied everything for me, except I need to switch the material out for the material I want, which is this guy. And now I'm going to approach the marker without using the reticle to look at it. There's our helmet. When I mouse over it, you see that the reticle turns to a little circle, and the helmet turns red. When I leave it, it turns back to a normal color. Uh, very simple. And then the next thing I'm going to do is add a click event. So same thing. Uh, this time I'm going to do it with a different material. And let's make that one green.
I feel like I have to lock a, walk a really long way for this. All right. So again, turns red. If I hold, you see it does this little click animation, and then it turns green. I didn't have to set up anything special on pointer events or anything like that. It maps to the standard input that you would normally deal with if you were dealing with a mouse. Uh, very straightforward. And uh, we provide a couple different scenes inside of the extension that sort of show you how to get up and running. Uh, one of them we're going to call the reticle interaction example. And this uses body space, uh, which I talked about before. So again, I'm actually using WASD right now. I'm walking around. It's attached to my body. When I look away, it comes back to me. Uh, very simple paradigm. Uh, sort of similar stuff. Uh, click hold. Interacting with buttons. If I want to interact with text, I can then have that automatically built into it. Next thing is I want to deploy to my device. So what do I need to do? So in the top of the bar, we have something called Smart Device Settings under the Daiquiri menu. I click this. It brings up this little uh, selector where I would hit an IP address and click Refresh. Now, I'm not going to do this today. Again, as I said, two companies know how to lock down internet. I don't want to trust that. Um, but what would happen is you would get a list of the applications that are installed on your device. You would have the ability to manage those applications, to uninstall those applications, to retrieve the logs from the applications if you're a developer and you want to see, you know, you're triggering some events and you want to make sure the right data is getting out of it. Uh, it's pretty easy. And then if I actually wanted to build, all I have to do now is then just go down and just click build. And there's a post process function that would basically take this IP, connect to the helmet, say, here's your application. It would show up in our launcher, which is our desktop, and you could just run it from there. It's very straightforward. So again, what we went through is we basically imported the extension to Unity. We configured Daiquiri's prefabs. We added some content. We added some interactivity. It all uses the standard Unity paradigm. So if you're a Unity developer, you don't have to relearn the wheel. And then how you would get that onto your device. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what else has been made with the SDK. Um, so we've worked with uh, a couple of our partners. Uh, Siemens has done some really interesting use cases around uh, maintaining wind turbines, yaw pitch motors, and uh, how to assemble a gas burner. We've worked with Mortensen to uh, visualize an undecimated uh, BIM model uh, of a hospital surgery wing. And so you, they displayed that in the helmet at true scale, and then they could see the plans overlaid on the actual building as they were building it. And then we've also worked with Touch Surgery, who's done a uh, carpal tunnel training refresher for surgeons. And uh, there's a bunch of other companies who have built a lot of really cool applications as well. For more information, I direct you to our website, developer.dacry.com. On it, we have all of our tutorials and videos about it, all just open to access. You don't need a Daiquiri login. And I don't know why they decided to put a huge picture of me, but thank you for joining. Uh, please visit our booth, try out the glasses. Uh, we just announced Omni, which is a new gesture controller. Um, and directly after this, we have Chris Baker at 10 o'clock on a different track talking about the use cases we did with Siemens. Uh, if we have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. And thank you for your time. All right, thanks a lot. Does anyone have any questions? We've got about uh, 10 minutes. Oh, they're up there. Yes, of course. I forgot. Yes. Cool. Uh, let's just take them in order. Um, I guess the first thing is, does it support all new versions of Unity? Uh, the answer is yes. We've supported from version 5.4 onward, which is uh, pretty good. Uh, we support the latest 5.6 very well. 5.5 had some regressions in the API for VR on the Unity side, so we had to do some workarounds. Uh, but it works. But 5.6 is definitely going to be your best place there. Uh, what's the developer experience outside of Unity like? What is the tool chain and deployment workflow? 
So um, if you're not talking using Unity, we're talking about uh, the other SDK which we provide, which is our native C++ SDK. Um, you use the same sort of deployment tool chain that you use inside Unity. Unity just has some really nice scripts that know how to manage it for you, but it's very similar to an ADB style paradigm uh, for loading and unloading applications. Uh, you use a standard tool chain. Uh, we, we use CLang uh, for compilation. And uh, we pretty much everything we do is exposed through one header file, so it's really, really simple. How stable is the display when the tracked object is occluded? Um, very stable. So the tracked object is a way that we use to localize content in the environment. It's something where I say, okay, I know where this is, so I know where everything else needs to be. But the actual tracker is uh, what we call our six degree of freedom positional tracker. So it's not tracking the image, it's recognizing the image, but it's tracking me. So no matter whether I see it once and move away, I see it and occlude it, we all know where the content needs to be around the room because we know where it was and we know where I am. So as I move through the space, it moves everything accordingly in such a way that it's, it's very simple and seems just as stable. Can you use other SDKs on the Daiquiri products? Um, so right now we are only supporting Daiquiri's SDKs. Uh, if you have any interest in using something else, please come talk with us, work with us. Happy to hear what you're interested in. What's the OS on the devices, Windows, Linux? Um, so the Daiquiri VOS is built on top of a Linux system. Uh, so when you're inside of Unity, you would basically deploy targeting the Linux platform and everything works pretty simply. But all of our tools work on both Windows, Linux, and Mac. So no matter what operating system you're used to, you don't really have to worry about the Linuxy parts if you're not a Linuxy person. Does it display all elements? Uh, yes, it also displays all Unity elements, particle system, camera effects. Um, as I said, the display object builds the cameras for you, but they are in the hierarchy. If you know how to access cameras through scripting, you would know how to find those cameras and apply different effects to them. About AR Toolkit, will Daiquiri launch new versions? Yes. Um, we announced last year AR Toolkit 6. Um, as of today or tomorrow, we will moved into an open beta for AR Toolkit 6. If you go to airtoolkit.org, you'll be able to download that. It's licensed under the Apache V2 license. Um, it's available, uh, but it's not fully launched. We're only in a beta. It's going to have some hard edges, but they've done some amazing work, and I'm really excited about it. And do you support multi-user environments? Um, you can do multi-user environments. Uh, Unity provides a pretty robust networking stack, and you can use that to sort of align your coordinate systems. Um, there are roadmap items to make that easier and more intuitive using the sort of Daiquiri UI UX, um, but we have had clients who have built multi-user environments using our helmet. How do we locate a Unity object in the AR environment? Does anyone have any more information on the second question there? Uh, is the person that asked the question here? Anyone want to provide more color on that question? <laughs> um, maybe it means is there any marker information? I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, so the, the same C++ API that we do for everything is exported through the Unity layer, so you have all those same APIs. Loading and unloading tracked objects is really simple. Um, and along with that, of course, you would provide information about the marker, be able to retrieve information about what tracked object you use. In terms of locating Unity objects in the AR environment, um, if you're talking programmatically, of course, Unity game objects have a, a pretty robust find system depending on what type of component and what type of object you're using. Um, if you're trying to find something in AR that you've put in AR and you're wearing the helmet or the glasses, you want to look around and see where it is in the room. Um, if you want, you can do use some sort of user guidance, maybe an arrow that points you the right way if you're worried about your user losing the content. Uh, but it, it should be fairly easy to find. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Very informative.